I'm Victoria Lambert and welcome to Daily Telegraph's A-Level Guide for Parents and Students. Charlie Ball is, is just joined us by the look of it. And I think Chris is joining as well now, yes? Yes, there's Chris. And this is Chris Millwood. Welcome to both of you. Um, so we're going to start with one of our questions. Um, one of our first questions for the evening is going to be um, how have uh, it's from Debbie Ensordine and it's how have apprenticeships and other qualifications been developed to compete with degrees? Why is a degree better? Um, Chris, do you, do you want to answer that first? Sure. OK, thanks. Um, so there are more apprenticeships every year, including increasingly at the higher and degree level. I think it's important to remember this is not an easy option. They can be very competitive to get into, but they are a great way to earn while you learn. And of course, because they're so rooted in work, you develop real world experience and knowledge whilst you're there. Government's been doing a lot to improve the quality and the standing of apprenticeships. I think there are now 150,000 employers working in 200,000 different parts of the country offering apprenticeships. And degree apprenticeships have increased quite radically, so from only around 750 five years ago to around 10,000 now. There are also other options than a degree, so you'll find that universities, and particularly further education colleges, will offer foundation degrees, HNCs, HNDs. They, again, can be a very good route, particularly if they're strongly linked with work, so, so, so closely developed with employers. Um, what you need to do is talk to careers advisors about the different options and make a decision about that. Um, on, on the question of is a degree better? Well, well, not necessarily. I think it depends on your interests and your strengths. You need to reflect on those, find out what options are available and what the experience is like. I think it's always worth finding out what you could progress onto in terms of uh, you know, other forms of education. So you may well find later in life that you want to carry on to a full degree, even if you don't start with that. So find out what partnerships are in place between colleges and universities. So that option is always open to you. Um, do, you do you want to add anything to that, Charlie? Um, what, what I would say is, that I, and I'm a labour market specialist, so my, my particular speciality is the jobs market, data and evidence around um, aspects pertaining to employment. Um, de uh, the degree apprenticeship and apprenticeships in general are a very, very good option, particularly if you have a firm and clear career view in mind. Where degrees have a slight advantage, perhaps, is in the jet, is, is in the breadth and the nature of the labour market in which they go into. Um, most job, and this will cover um, the first part of the answer to a number of questions that we've we've already seen. So, we'll state this up front: most jobs for graduates. It would appear um, from the data that we have, the majority of jobs for graduates are subject blind. So it doesn't really matter what subject you've done. Um, and that takes some of the pressure off subject choice. Um, but it means that if you've got a very vocational option, a very, very vocational idea in mind that's served by a taking a degree apprenticeship, then that might be a very good route, particularly as it gets work experience. Um, it gives, gives you work experience and allows you to experience um, working for a company and working in that industry. It's also always worth bearing in mind that one of the crucial advantages of work experience and a work-based learning programme is it may tell you that you do not want to pursue that career. And that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Because the time to make that decision is when you're young, not when you're my age. That's not a nice light on my employers. Um, I love my job. But, but you want to try and make those decisions and get those ideas out of your way when you're early in your career. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that people who are leaving, leaving school with their A-levels, um, who are 18 years old now, are likely to be working for the next 50 years. And so um, those decisions and the decisions that they make now about their future career, you should allow a little bit of give in them because things will be rather different in 50 years time. 50 years ago, man had only just walked on the moon. Microsoft and Apple and Mr. Kipling were only one year old. Right. And actually, at the time of speaking, England was still the World Cup holders. <laughs> you know, 50 years this. So do bear in mind, just about, Brazil were just about to win. Um, so do bear in mind that the, over the course of a working career is extremely lengthy. 
and the choices you make now about your career and your your education um, will have a bearing on where you are later in your career but will not put you on an immutable path that's what you've just said is very interesting because i think a lot of people right now will be worrying about say doing one of like a pure art subject thinking that's right they're absolutely terrified and, and panic buying into a course that seems very, very um, vocational. But you're saying that's, that's okay right. not to do that. It's okay to that's follow your right. heart still rather than, than your head in that sense. One of the commonest questions I get when I do this kind of event, and I did, I, back in the olden days, if anybody remembers, we used to meet face to face. I don't know if anybody <laughs> remembers that was a very, very long time ago. But I used to do a lot of these events and I, I did a lot of events with parents. And at the end of every event, I would always get a really, really nice pair of very concerned parents who would sidle up to me after all the public questions had been done and they'd say, my daughter is going to get really, really good results and she wants to be an artist, but we think she should study medicine. Yeah. How do we convince her? Or something along those lines. To which the answer is, would you like it if your GP would rather be an artist? And but with a, with a, with a, with the exception of a very small group of very small group of um, choices a uh, very very small group of vocational subjects most people who take medical degrees go into med the very large majority of people who take medical degrees on nursing go on to those courses go on to those professions and remain there most of us change careers and most most people change careers sometimes quite radically and the choices you make now are important but you should not see them as setting the the course of your future work for the next 50 years in stone immutably my 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 first degree my phd is in analytical chemistry and i thought i was going to be an academic or okay. work in a lab did you um chris did you, did you find the same thing that um you are where you might have anticipated leaving university or are you somewhere completely different um, so, uh, hands up here, I studied English literature at university, so I didn't think oh, hi, I would necessarily, <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I didn't think I would necessarily end up in this position. Um, I think one of the interesting things about our higher education system is people often feel the benefits further down the line, later mm. in life, so it's equipping you with a frame of mind, a way of thinking, critical apparatus, cognitive skills, and as Charlie said, you know, most forecasts say the labour market is going to change hugely over the coming decades. So you're, it's, we're talking about equipping you with a frame of mind to adapt to that. And a lot of employers will then, you know, help you get the skills you need to do the job you're going to do. Yeah. Well, um, let's go on to the next question. This is from Kay Pearson, who I think I saw in the chat. I think she's here. Um, my son wants to enter the church ministry and he is doing a theology degree at university worth it. And what are the current salary thresholds for a paying student debt? So I think that's to Chris first. What about um, okay. repayment thresholds? Talk us through that and then tell us a little bit about what you think. Yeah, about yeah, yeah. So, so, so is it worth it? I'm going to let Charlie do that. I feel I need a higher power to say whether a theology degree is worth it or not. Um, let me talk um, technically about the thresholds. Um, so uh, what you need to do is have a look at the government guidance and we'll circulate the link for that on, on repaying student loans. Um, you start paying from the April after you finish your course. You pay 9% of gross earnings above around 26,000. So that's around about 500 a week or 2,200 a month. And it's worth thinking about it as a graduate contribution, so a highly protected graduate contribution. Um, it's written off after 30 years, which could well be pertinent to careers. You know, sometimes what we talk about, you know, high public benefit, but low private salary careers, it could be relevant to that. It's also worth looking at what is said about interest rates there as well, because that will also affect the amount of debt. And broadly, interest rates are around RPI plus 3%. Charlie will now answer the really uh, more profound question. <laughs> about, you know, is theology worth it? Well... I mean, firstly, taking theology uh, is uh, carrying on a proud and noble tradition. Theology is the foundation of higher education in Europe, um, and the, the study and, and, and teaching theology is the basis of our modern university system. So, um, in a way, our whole university system is set up to teach and deliver theology qualifications. I have here to my 
to, to my left, to your right, um, because you know, you're looking at <laughs> all the data available that we have available on theology first degrees. Theology has a, a lower unemployment rate than the average. It has a higher employment rate than the average. The most common job for theology graduates is the clergy. Um, <laughs> there is actually quite a good group of theology, um, le uh, theology academics and teachers um, who work quite hard on promoting options for theology. They get slightly cross with me when I say that theology is a vocational job. It is a vocational job. The most common outcome for theology graduates is to go into ministry of one kind or another. Um, and it's the main way of getting into ministry. So you're, if your son wants to be a minister, it is, a, it is the basis of going into that profession. However, there are a lot of other options for theology graduates. Um, theologists go into all corners of the, of, of, of the um, employment market, the skilled employment market. Um, quite recently, I had a theologist working for me, although she's gone off to do a PhD now, who she was exceptional. She was actually a very, very good data analyst, a very good analyst of secondary sources because um, theologists are trained, of course, to examine um, the meaning and context of literature and data and information, which is a very, very handy skill to have in the modern world. So the question of, is theology worth it? If your son wants to be in the ministry, absolutely. If he changes his mind during the course of, the, of his degree, he still has plenty of options available. Theology is a well-regarded and well-established part of the labour market. Is, do you think there's something to be said with something like theology? If you want to go into the ministry, you're also going to be studying with your peer group and you're going to be studying with a, quite a niche group of people who really feel, have, have a deep interest in what you have, which you may not be finding out in your social circle. Absolutely. And actually, it's a very important part of the university experience and one which is going to be some of the trickier parts to, um, to perhaps replicate um, if we go to a partially virtual experience. That fact of you meeting your peers and meeting your, your groups and making networks that in many cases will serve you throughout your life. Um, and bear in mind, actually, um, in many, many careers, through your, through your personal networks um, is the second most important way for a graduate to find their job after yeah. agency work, after, after coming through recruiting agencies at the moment. It depends on the state of the labour market, but at the moment that's the case. And often those networks are not your parents, um, or, or even your lecturers, they're actually the people who you've met in your course, your friends, who said, hey, get a load of this advert, or get a load of this position, or I heard about this, that, and the other, it's just right for you. Yeah. Um, and so, absolutely, um, one of the advantages of going on to, onto a particularly a higher vocational course is you will be meeting people who want to do the same jobs as you, uh, as you do, have the same interests as you do, and will meet people in those careers and in those, in those positions who will be valuable to you later on in life. Okay. Um, we're going to now go to Lisa Richardson's question, and Lisa wants to know if the actual, the whole thing that we're discussing, you know, the financial value of going to university, does it depend, does the, is the answer different depending on the degree subject you plan to take? So, uh, Chris, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Does it matter what you're, t what you're studying? So, I think um, if you're looking in terms of returns, you know, jobs, earnings, careers you can go into. Uh, we're getting better data on that all the time. And, and of course, that does, uh, it is influenced by the institution you go to, the subject you study, but also you'll find that courses can be quite different across the sector. So, you know, so some, some computer science courses, for example, have a very strong technical component and very oriented towards computing, whereas others will be more related to IT and management. So you really need to get under the skin of what kind of course it is and what destinations it leads to. And that will be more profound than just the type of institution or indeed the subject area. Uh, we run in the OFS a website called Discover Uni. You can go to a course, you can see what happened to the students on that course, what kind of careers and destinations they went into. And that's the kind of research that you need to do. I think, as Charlie said at the start, subject is only one part of the equation. Um, so, so Charlie, you might want to go on and talk about one. Yeah, Charlie. Well, yeah, I mean, as, as Chris said, and and, and the, fir the first thing to do is, is to flag up and, and to plug Discover Uni because um, if you're considering university courses, the first thing you should do when you're talking to the university is ask what the graduates from those courses have gone to do, because um, it will give you a guide to the sort of things that um, people 
from the kind of backgrounds and the kind of interests and, and, and qualifications that you have um, have gone on gone on to do um, in the workplace. Subject is important, but as we say, the majority of jobs for graduates are, are quite subject blind. Um, yeah, sure. If you want to um, study medicine, or if you want to be a civil engineer, or a graphic designer, or something highly vocational, um, then the, the, the question of you know what's the value of the qualification compared to other options will vary. Um, and, uh, will vary and it will differ if you take a generic course but the other, the other thing to bear in mind as Chris said is there isn't a curriculum so to speak across subjects even in my old subjects in chemistry there's a lot of diversity in the kind of qualifications and the kind of all kind of institutions that offer some specialised in physical chemistry some specialise in organic chemistry and pharmaceutical industry link ups some specialise in the inorganic and, and, and maths based areas that are useful for the um, chemicals industry and the chemical engineering in, the chemical engineering industry and the individual makeups of each course um, even in subjects that seem to the layperson quite well defined can be actually quite different and point in quite different directions it's also sometimes quite geography sensitive so if you're taking for example a business studies course in the city of london um, the institutions and organizations with which they are linked will be rather different to those that um, they are linked with um, in for an institution that specializes in working with small businesses in the north of England. So do be sensitive to context and do be sensitive to and particularly if your your you or your child are not sure about what they want to do for a living. And, and let's be absolutely clear, it is absolutely fine not to be sure about what you want to do for a living at 18 or 21 or even 25. It's a bit more of a problem at 40. But uh, um, but when you're younger, it's absolutely fine to not be clear about what you want to do and universities are well set up to help you guide through guide your way through that so yes it is a question that is diff the, the, to which the answer is different depending on the subject but perhaps not as different as it might first appear okay um in the in um uh, peter murder has has asked have we got any data on university st um studies at return on investment i don't know um Charlie, is that one for you again? I think that's actually, well, the R, again, the ROI is a difficult one to do. And part of the reason for ROI being difficult is because actually we don't have a lot of long-term data on salaries um, and on career paths. And one of the dirty secrets of uh, labour market research across the globe is we don't actually know a great deal about what people do later on in their careers. It's partly because of the nature of labour market change um and part because it's extremely difficult and costly to gather this kind of information we tend to only get really good quality information on the careers of people who have been in the jobs market for a long time a census day um during the census um every 10 years during the census um and so it's a very difficult it's a very difficult um uh, undertaking yeah most people's careers tend to flatten out in their late 30s early 40s there's some careers that have different trajectories but most people so once we and, and and the the data sets that we have on salary that are linked to the tax record data what we call the longitudinal educational outcomes the leo data do have some quite good and quite enlightening data earlier on in the first half of people's careers but roi is a notoriously difficult thing to um, to calculate and it's very very it's very much a moving target um so um to pick a good example um in at the moment the best paid non-graduate job on average is a train driver so if you look at all the roles and all the occupations um the best paid job that you can get without going to university or that, that is that is for which the majority of people do not have university qualifications is a train driver. Do we think in the next 50 years that will remain the same over the working lifetime of um, with, with developments in public transports, in automated automated driving, um, and in, in transport use? Do we think that will remain the, will remain the same? I'm not so sure. Yeah. And so it's quite difficult to calculate ROI um, on qualifications when you think back to people who are just retiring now, um, obviously 
um, the internet was only invented in the second, or the only became into wide usage in the second half of their careers. And so large, large um, areas of quite lucrative work in information technology and computer science only came out in when, 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 when people, many people who were retiring were in the mid parts of their careers. Um, mobile devices are 10, 15 years old in wide usage. Um, and so this kind of widespread change in technology and in, in types of work mean that very few occupations um, remain constant and the same kind of market value in the workplace over a career. Um, there are a few exceptions, medicine being an obvious one, law is another. Um, one of the things that's most interesting about the next 20 to 30 years is that the very, very clever people in Silicon Valley have identified those those um, occupations in which practice has not changed for a, a long period as being the most prone to disruption by AI. What would they be? Law is very much in the sights of people. That's for interesting. Example. Yeah. Um, and, and if your if the way that your job has been done has not changed in 50, 60 years, you're quite prone to being automated. Ouch. Well, well, I mean, if you think about the massive changes that journalism has undergone in the last 20 years. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I'm doing a job that didn't exist 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and many of the people we're talking to. So ROI is a is very much, I mean, we, could, we could calculate it now, but somebody basing a career choice on that figure, particularly if you had a, a marginal ROI that was close yeah. to the turn threshold, I would be very reluctant to base any career yeah. long-term decisions on that kind of data. And I'm a statistician. <laughs> well, um, let's go on. Let's move on to Paula, Paula Hassel's question. She says that my daughter has been offered a gift of £9,000 to cover her first year fees. Should she get a loan anyway and use the cash for living on or even invest it? What do you think, Chris? That's, um, so I, I think this is going to be quite a short discussion <laughs> because neither Charlie or I are financial advisors and neither of us are trained to give advice of this kind. Uh, what you do need to do is, as I said, look very carefully at the guidance, the government's guidance, and we'll send you the link yeah. on repayment. Uh, look at um, uh, good, reliable, and popular sources like Money Savings Expert, yeah. which has a lot, a huge amount of information on um, studying at university and different dimensions for that. And if necessary, talk to an independent financial advisor. So, so they will give you much better and more reliable on your individual uh, advice on your individual circumstances than the manager of us would. Um, and, and that's the same advice that would would go, I think, to Anne Anderson, who's asked a question, how can we support our daughter to re repay the debt? Again, what we're saying is get expert advice. Don't mess around. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, right. So the next question um, is by Celine Orzabal de la Quintana. Um, will the examples include US or EU universities, also specialist colleges such as Cordwainer, Slade, Royal Academy of Music? Um, can you talk about specialists and how the difference of university systems? Yeah, Chris? Sh shall I start on yeah, that? Chris. And then Charlie, come in. So I think um, you know, one of the great things about the English higher education system is specialist institutions. You know, we sometimes talk about them as the jewels in the crown. Um, you can study in an intensive way uh, on a topic like music or drama or art and design and really intensively develop your practice uh, and indeed your theoretical understanding of that. And we're distinctive in this country in having so many good specialist institutions. Everybody's heard of the London ones with Royal in their name, like the Royal Academy of Music, Royal College of Music, uh, the Royal College of Art, but there are also terrific local specialists, often with histories rooted in you know, local civic arts communities in places like Plymouth and Norwich and Manchester and Leeds. So I think it's a great option. What you do need to do is there might be different application deadlines. So conservatoires in music will have earlier deadlines. And of course, uh, in order to get in, you need to demonstrate you're good at in practice. So, so, so you have, a, have to have a very high level of musical proficiency for a conservatoire 
artistic proficiency for an art course. And of course that in art may well involve um, foundation years. So you need to look very carefully at the requirements, but I, I think it's, um, it's a great option. And some of the great figures in our society have gone through, have gone through that route. Um, Do you want to add anything on special, Charlie? Sorry. No, I mean, I, I, Chris is absolutely right. So our specialist institutions are absolutely first rate, and many of them are. Uh, and, and the other things bear in mind, of course, that if you if you uh, want to specialise in a particular area that's covered by an institution, you will, of course, be working people who are versed and deeply rooted in those areas. And I, I work quite a lot with the agricultural universities who are also absolutely outstanding, um, really, really high quality institutions. And um, and so, yeah, we, we would, you know, we, a lot of attention is paid to the, the, the large generalist universities that offer a wide, wide range of, wide range of roles, uh, wide range of options, but specialist institutions are absolutely up there along, um, alongside the best. Um, in terms of information about overseas, um, one of the things that is sometimes difficult to, to tell or to realise embedded here is that we have in the UK the, the best higher education data and, and the most comprehensive higher education data in the world and, and those 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 systems that have coverage national level coverage of higher education options and data um, to rival ours have generally done so by taking cues and examples from our systems particularly on graduate outcomes on data on graduate outcomes the US has pretty good data at individual institution level um, but don't have a national system and same goes to the Canadians um, so it, we don't have quite the same wealth and variety of information on, on the options and the outcomes of graduates from of, in, in, other, in other countries. And we don't have the same level of um, ability to analyse and understand the subtleties of employment and the labour market. Yeah. That said, we do have some quite good information, uh, quite up to date information at the moment from organisations like the Institute of Student Employers who've done quite a lot of work looking at how the pandemic has um, affected the graduate labour market across uh, around the world. The short answer is everybody has been affected and the UK's, the effect on the UK in terms of employment and particularly skilled employment is not um, unusual. Um, we, we've not been as particularly um, severely affected um, and very much in the mainstream as far as the graduate labour market is concerned. So to head off any question, you know, if, if you're thinking all oh, the graduate jobs market's a bit rough in the UK right now, which it certainly is, where would be better? Um, where where could I where can I go to seek my fortune? Um, China. Yeah. But apart from that, you know, there is no there is no magic land of milk and honey where things have where where the virus has left everyone untouched and the graduate labour market is remain has remained um, damaged. I think if you if you want the people going to applying to American universities is quite a big thing at the moment. And yes. in terms of financial, you know, reward for that, it is so expensive to go. Can it make sense? Can you earn that money back in the UK? Or having to earn stay I mean, in America I mean, and find to earn there. If if you go to a first rate American university and get a high quality um, qualification from you know a global a, a university with a global reputation. Um, then that is a passport to work around the world. Okay. Well, I mean, the offer, the, 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 the guarantee is the same as the guarantee yeah. we can get graduates here. The guarantee that we can get to graduates here is if you go to university in the UK, you will probably get a decent job that will make you a decent living. Yeah. That's the best, we, that's the only promise we can make. That will probably happen. Yeah. We can't promise it. Nobody can guarantee that if you go to university anywhere in the world, you will make a great career and you will get a good job and everything will turn out great for you. All we can say is that it will probably happen. Yeah. Um, and, and the same goes the same the same goes to the US. But obviously you know if you go to Yale or Harvard or one of the other big name, one of the one of the other world class American institutions and come out with a good quality degree from there, you know, that will never be a problem to put on your CV. Yeah. Okay, that's that's fascinating. Um Going on to the next, our next question, Robin Siggins um, has said, will the number of apprenticeships, internships um, available to 18 year olds be increasing? Um, I, think, uh, I think we've still got, oh, we've got Chris. Um, Chris, do you want to answer that first? Um, are there going to be more apprenticeships and internships for 18 year olds? 
So, uh, as I said at the start, we're expecting apprenticeships to increase. So, so the government has high ambitions to increase apprenticeship numbers, including at higher level and degree level. And you've seen how degree level apprenticeships have increased over the last five years. And I think we're seeing the public sector become more engaged with uh, apprenticeships as well. Big announcement today around nursing apprenticeships, for example. So I think you can expect apprenticeships to increase um, over time um, from a fairly low base in terms of higher education numbers, but around 10,000 at the moment. Uh, in terms of other forms of work placement, um, so I think this is really interesting. There are very particular challenges around work placement during the period of the pandemic. So, mm -hmm. so clearly going out to work, working part time while you study, um, there are real challenges for universities sustaining that in the current environment. And you need to talk to your in, in the individual universities you're applying to about what they're planning for next term, what they're planning for next year. And hopefully we won't be in this situation beyond this year. So some may be delaying placements or, or sandwich years, for example. I think I'm seeing, so, so some universities have a really long history of sandwich years. You know, you go to universities like Aston or Bath or Surrey, a very high proportion of courses have some years because that's their origins. They work very closely with business and, 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 and you have a high likelihood of doing it. But others, they've been trying to grow it, possibly less than a year, shorter work placements. And increasingly, I think universities have tried to make that available to students, whatever subject they study, but, but you, they can't guarantee that. So you need to find out the likelihood of getting a, a placement, what support you'll get, what the terms of it will be. Well, um have you got any other add to that, Charlie? No, I think Chris has covered. I think well, one Chris thing. The, the, the areas there, uh, one thing I think might be worth mentioning is is that apprenticeships now cover a great deal more than traditional subjects, don't they? Because for many of us, we think of apprenticeships going down one sort of line, and a lot of it's kind of connected with manufacturing and engineering. But actually, you can get apprenticeships in, in everything from racehorses, can't you, to to fashion and, 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 and that sort of thing. I think it's, it is. I mean, just just to expand on one point, one point that Chris made. One of the big challenges that business has faced um, with, with with the pandemic has been delivery of um, work placements and work experience and so on. I mean, in the early part of the pandemic, particularly in April and May, we saw a lot of these um, options being closed off because it was it was very difficult to sustain them. However, um, it has been one area where businesses have been working quite hard to develop virtual options, and so. If people are concerned that yes, a lot of work placements and apprenticeships and so forth have been curtailed as a consequence of a, a, a recession, it's some, a, a pandemic. It's, a, it's something that the um, that the industry the industry is is very aware of and is actively trying to to mitigate. And so some of the questions some, and some of the challenges that Chris rightly mentions about delivering work experience in a virtualized environment may hopefully be resolved and in a way that might bring long-term benefit and improvements to the whole delivery of work experience as well um let's move on um ruth campion clement who is um hopefully with us she says we live in wales if my daughter goes to a welsh university the welsh nhs will pay her fees why is there no incentive for her to do this to go to an english university and do the same chris so health and education are what's called devolved matters in the UK. So, so the governments in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, uh, they drive policy in health and education and they, they determine how uh, studies are supported and indeed uh, how, how, how the services work. Um, so there will be a different pattern of support for students based in Wales and you need to look at Student Finance Wales in relation to, to what's open to you. In England, nurses and other allied health trainees um, moved a couple of years ago onto a finance system more common to other uh, students uh, but the government has now been bringing uh, in increasing financial incentives to study nursing because it's very ambitious about growing nursing trainings during the coming year to meet uh, demand so have a good look at the nhs learning support fund if you're in england because that will set out clearly what's available to you is that is that true in scotland and northern ireland as well yeah, so they're all devolved matters, health and education, and of course, nursing training yeah. combined health and education. So so you will see different patterns in in those countries. Charlie, have you got anything to add to that? No, no, finance, this is very much <laughs> uh, um, Susan, um, uh, sorry, not Susan, um, uh, Sarah Nelson, 
says, um, in the event that the pandemic interrupts or adversely affects teaching, are universities considering a refund or a rollover of fees? And what happens financially if there's more strike action? Sure. Okay, this is a really good question. Um, so students do have consumer rights and, and the Office of Students who I work for has published guidance on rights and we again we can circulate that so you can see that. Um, it's worth saying to start with that universities have remained open yeah. um, even during the most intensive period of the lockdown and learning and teaching has carried on although of course a lot of it moved online when we were in the depths of lockdown and I think what you're expecting to see in most universities and colleges in autumn is some kind of combination of online and face-to-face -face delivery and they may have moved for example more lectures online where there were very large groups that are still doing more you know, tutorial support face to face. I'm not going to try and say what will happen on every course across the country because it will differ between universities and it will differ between subject areas and often, obviously some types of provision like lab based provision will be affected in different ways. So again you need to find out um, exactly what they say is going to happen in the autumn and indeed what, what they're planning if rules change. So for example if if rules change around social distancing in particular places across the country, then, then how universities would respond to that. Um, there are no blanket refund policies in place because universities are aiming to provide equivalent learning. And indeed, they think in terms of learning outcomes. They will be trying to get you to the same learning outcomes at the end of your course. But we have told universities that they need to give you clear information about what you can expect and indeed how it could change. Um, if rules change, they need to keep you updated on uh, if there are changes and, and if public health advice changes. They need to have fair terms and conditions so they can't have just kind of blanket right yeah. to change things. And they need to let you know if things are going to change. There are complaints mechanisms. You have to start with your university and then you can go for, to, to a body called the Office for the Independent Adjudicator for Higher Education and they can make recommendations around refund. Um, but it's important to say that is not a blanket expectation in the current circumstances because universities are working really hard to get you an equivalent learning experience. I'm sure Julia Buckingham, who's, who's involved in the session tomorrow at Telegraph is running, will talk quite a lot about that and all the steps they've put in place. Um, on strike action, pretty much the same. So, so we, we gave advice to students and to universities when there was strike action uh, a while ago. Um, universities have to do everything they can to mitigate the effects of that. Um, make up for missed sessions, uh, innovate around time tackling, for example, but then students have rights and they can follow complaints processes. Um, moving on, because I'm keeping an eye on the clock, um, Susan Hargreaves has got a question which I think a lot of people will be thinking, which is, is it worth deferring for a couple of years until normal university life is more normal and therefore better value? So do we hang fire? What, what do you think? Sure, um, Charlie, what do you think? Well, I mean, the first thing to bear in mind is that uh, let's hope things are better normal, and more normal in <laughs> two years. Uh, otherwise, we've got a lot more problems than worrying about when people are going to go to university. Um, there was earlier in the earlier in the summer a significant amount of concern about what would happen if there was widespread deferral um, until next year. Um, what would that mean for universities this year? And what would it mean next summer? Would that mean excessive competition? Um, it appears from the UCAS figures that applications have gone ahead, if anything, with with um, increased yeah. vigour this this summer. Which is perfectly rational. Um, people want to defer going into the jobs market as much as they want to go defer going into education, um, and, and, and with and with good reason. Um, so the question: If you want to defer until next year, it looks like the fear that there might be a big avalanche of applications in 2021 to make up for a shortfall in 2020 may have abated a little bit and of course it will be quite rational to do that but when you're applying do bear in mind that universities will be quite keen to find out what it is that you did in the last in the in the in the period into uh, of 2020 to 2021 um in the same way that um uh, again to, to um overcome or to potentially answer other questions um, employers um, understand that degrees have been very different and delivered very differently in the latter half of this year. Um, universities will be aware that people have had unusual experiences, but will still want to know what you've learnt from that period. So, yes, defer 
if you want to but do do something in that time period and do do bear in mind that and i'll say this we've, we've we've only got a short period do bear in mind that the graduate labor market has been very heavily affected by pandemic and every single piece of information tells us that non-graduates have been affected far far worse so the choice is not necessarily going to be oh i'll go and get a job yeah I because that's a lot easier said than done in the current in the current level. i know we're, we're coming up absolutely to the last minute so i'm just wondering if there's any questions that have popped up during the, 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 the we could go on all, all the evening i'm quite sure i noticed somebody talked about russell groups um russell there group is, university still still great value still go for it the data suggests the, the, at the moment, or at least the labour market before pandemic, suggests that if that the, going to Russell Group was an advantage, but not as much of an advantage as getting a 2-1 compared to okay. a 2-2 because of the nature of the way that universe, the way that particularly the large employers sift their applications. And particularly as larger employers are now looking at um, applications on a regionalised basis. So they're aware, for example, a lot of people don't necessarily want to work in London and they have large presences in, um, outside the capital. So they'll look at regional institutions. So the choice is quite simple. If you think that for one reason, say you've got the University of the University of X and the new University of X, and you think, well, I could go to the University of X, which is Russell Group Institution, but I might get a 2 2 there. But if I go to the new University of X because I can live at home um, and the course suits me and whatever, and I'll probably get a 2-1 there, you may well be better off going into the new University of X because that 2-1 is more important in the labour market that we have pre-pandemic yeah. than the Russell Group, non-Russell Group split because there are a lot of very, very good yeah. institutions outside. Of I'm going to quickly ask as well, someone, I can see Joanna Osborne's put up, is psychology currently regarded as a good choice of degree? What do we think? It's a very popular yeah. degree, one of the most popular going. The, the unemployment rate for psychologists is below the average. It's not a very vocational degree anymore in the same way that it was in the way that it was 25 years ago. That seems to be thanks to Robbie Coltrane and Cracker. Every generation is <laughs> a, a popular program that prompts people to go and study that qualification in large numbers. In my day, it was, it was all creatures great and small and vets for people with long memories and to just to age me a little bit. Um, then it was psychologists and then it was CSI and everybody wants to do forensic science. Um, and so as a consequence, psychology um, stopped being a vocational qualification and became a much more generalist qualification. Qualification, but universities adapted to that and, and, and psychology, a good psychology course, now gives just the mix of quantitative and qualitative skills that employers look for. And so in, and psychologists go into large numbers into the business services industry where they're welcomed. Just don't drop your math. Okay, so you need math on it. <laughs> I think we're going to have to close it. I think we've reached the very end. Thanks everyone for coming and listening. Thank you for your questions. That's been absolutely brilliant. Charlie, Chris, thank you so much, both of you. It's been really, really interesting evening.